Hello, and welcome to a special Super Sons for the Love of Comics crossover event. In celebration of Crisis on Infinite Earths, I, your co-host, David Gallagher, and my other co-host, Adam Vermillion. Hi, I'm here. Yeah. Our, uh, we have taken over the Super Sons podcast in order to talk about um, some beloved superhero shows from DC Comics. Um, I am David Gallagher. You may know me from being a co-host of For the Love of Comics, as well as author of uh, Green Lantern, Core Convergence, Dark Star and the Winter Guard for Marvel, and Ghost Recon for Ubisoft. Oh, but what about your own books? Those aren't. Oh, and I also write The Only Living Boy and The Only Living Girl, as well as The Werewolf Western High Moon. There we go. Now, now it feels complete. <laughs> I was trying to make it like superhero specific, but yeah, you're right. Now it feels more yeah. complete. Yeah, but see, since we're doing a crossover, I want to make sure that all the tie-ins are listed so everybody knows exactly how much money they're going to be spending on this event. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. And joining me is Adam Vermillion. Adam, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am one of the other co-hosts of For the Love of Comics. I used to host a, another podcast that is no longer around called Panels and Pizza. And I'm, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's really all there is to know about me. I I can eat copious amounts of pizza as well, so hey, um, that maybe that's my superpower. Well, you know, that would not be unlike uh, a Flash character known by the name of Chunk. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a character from the Flash who eats a bunch of stuff because he's got a he he internalizes a black hole. Okay. So he's got like a cosmic tapeworm. Yeah, he's got essentially a cosmic tapeworm. So, uh, <laughs> so today the show we're going to be covering is the very first episode of the Super Friends um, called The Power Pirates. Uh, it aired on September 8th, 1973, and it is an episode that is 42 minutes and 52 seconds long. Um it so is. can you tell us? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the characters that we will see in the Super Friends, and a little bit about um, your personal history with the Super Friends, Adam? I, I can. I I definitely can. Let's see. For now, for this very first season of the Super Friends, uh, we have uh, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Batman, and Robin. I, I guess they're considered one because they just say there are four of them and then uh superman and they're joined by the junior super friends marvin wendy and wonder dog and the opening narration states david that they're from cosmic legend and and that immediately right there threw me for a loop because i'm like what cosmic legend are they from i what what, what does this mean does this is this does this just sound cool well, I mean, I think it. I think it's very helpful to have. I mean, it does sound really cool, but if you think about it, uh, the Super Friends are from like the farthest reaches of the universe, right? But all of them, well, Superman himself, but the rest of them are from Earth. Well, it's true. The rest of the, well, I mean, Wonder Woman is is Wonder Woman technically from Earth? Well, Themyscira, yeah. I don't know. See, I, I already immediately started, like, dissecting this children's cartoon from 46 years ago. Oh, you automatically <laughs> start dissecting it? So you're yes. like, oh, hey. From the opening like, narration. <laughs> from the opening narration. You were like, hey, let's talk about this. Let's <laughs> criticize this show. But, you know, like, <laughs> Superman can be enough of a cosmic legend to... Uh, Superman is, is a pretty big legend. I mean, like... Maybe his reputation spans galaxies. That 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 could be. Uh, 
No, those, 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 ugh, why am I stuttering? Okay. Those are the characters. And those, that's who currently makes up the super friends. So what's really interesting about this episode is that it really comes from this era of, um, you know, a lot of it comes from this pre era of Scooby Doo, you know, like, um, filmation had had a lot of success with, uh, the Aquaman, Superman and Batman shows, um, in the 1960s. And so bringing this together, you know, they had the Batman Superman hour, um, the, uh, Batman and Robin had also shown up in the Scooby-Doo movies. Um, Ted Knight, uh, who was the narrator for the filmation cartoons with Green Lantern and Aquaman and Adam and Hawkman, you know, he returns, um, to lend his voice to the series, Bud Collier, um, He had died, but he was replaced with Danny Dark in the series. And, you know, so you get a lot of these. There's, in a way, a lot of, um, in a way, there's there's sort of this legacy that sets up this very first episode of the Super Friends. It's, It's sort of like a pilot episode. It's not the Justice League of America, which in a way, I think when you're a younger kid has a, has a harsh, harshness to it like the super friends make it seems friendly almost like approachable yes and they bring that i think because of the success of batman and robin in the scooby-doo mystery episodes i think that that's why you end up with this goofier almost this superhero scooby-doo in the form of wonder wonder dog and with um marvin almost being like shaggy yeah, like Shaggy, but voiced by uh, Fred. Whoever yes, that, Frank Welker. Frank. Frank. Was it Frank Welker doing Fred? Yeah. Okay, I knew he did Scooby-Doo, but all right. Yeah, man. He's versatile. Okay, awesome. It very, because that's also Megatron and Soundwave and... And, and yeah. an Iceman from Spider-Man is Amazing Friends. Was it? Okay, wow. I got to look at Welker's IMDb if I have like a month to read all the (laughs) listings um so So, one thing i wanted to ask what you what you thought of this little bit of uh dialogue or especially now knowing the show is from 1973 and he probably didn't have anything to do with any of this at that point in time did you find it interesting that uh, the um super friends had to save a train that was going through donner pass I know I that was initially I was we're gonna get to the summary uh, in just a second but yes I, I do want to talk about that because I thought that that was hysterical um, so the synopsis of the episode the power pirate is when massive amounts of energy began to disappear all over the world the super friends must put a stop to who whomever is stealing it but where is the energy going and how does the an inspector from scotland yard who happens to be at every location fit into the puzzle so um we're going to get to exactly your question in just a minute but one so that's the synopsis um what's interesting is when the story opens an older gentleman is skiing in ski valley falls and hurts his leg As he's there, holding his leg, he sees what appears to be an alien. The alien grabs an amulet from around his neck and shines it towards the injured man. Dun, dun, dun. And then we cut to uh, members of the Hall of Justice just sort of hanging out. This is the first appearance ever of the Hall of Justice. Um, And then we get to see the superheroes sort of hanging out. Tell us a little bit about the scene as you remember it, Adam. Uh, it opens up with uh, Superman arm wrestling some unknown person at the time, and then the rest of the Super Friends standing around wondering if Superman needs help. And who does that unknown person? Who is that unknown person? It's Marvin. Of Marvin Marvin White Junior Super Friend. Is that his last name? Marvin White. Marvin okay. White. All right. I I was just like, okay, Marvin, all right. Um, I, I mostly was just wondering, why, why, why are the Super Friends tolerating these children in their, in their hideout? <laughs> well, I think that... Um, Other than Robin. Yeah. 
Right. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you and I talked to, about this a little bit before the show. Um, and one of the things that I, I find interesting is that Marvin in this episode indicates that he has at least one, maybe two superpowers um, that I find fascinating. The first is, is that he shows that he can fly. Okay. So he kind has of some barely. Yeah, he has barely flight, but he has like flight. He runs away from everybody after he's foolishly tried to to take down Superman with arm wrestling, and he sort of hovers in the sky. And Wendy says, I, "So help you, Marvin, if you fall down and you mess up this cake, I'm going to be <laughs> so angry with you." And then Marvin's yes. like, "Oh boy, that's right. right. Yeah, the cake she had specifically baked for the weekly meeting, right." So, uh, so he demonstrates at least a degree of flight, and then he also it is arguable that Marvin may have some degree of super strength. He is shown to arm wrestle Superman, but also Batman has a line that says, "Super strength isn't all, Marvin. Sometimes people can use the powers that they have in their own heads called their brain." And you're like, "Yes, he huh. did." So there, there is an indication that Marvin may have a degree of superhuman strength. Okay. Uh, I think they probably keep Marvin around because they know that if they don't have Marvin around, he could cause more trouble without him than he could with them. Oh, so they're keeping an eye on him they're for his own right. good. Got it. Right. You, you brought up the brains as a superpower. I noticed that was a theme that ran throughout the episode that – like the lesson they are trying to impart on the children of 1973 watching this is that you can't always rely on brute strength. Sometimes you right. think you went through a problem. I, I did like that. Well, I like that idea that you don't need superpowers to make a difference in the world, you right. know? Um, and uh, so the reason they keep Marvin around, I think is, is ultimately because he is more of a danger by himself than he is around the super friends. All right. You know, and then, uh, Wendy, I think is incredibly, I don't know what wonder dogs powers are, but, uh, I mean, he can sort of vaguely talk, but, uh, <laughs> so I, I think he could probably smell really well. Um, but I think ultimately Wendy though, is an incredible asset to the team. You know, um, she is the daughter of the detective that trained Batman, or the niece of the do- the detective who trained Batman. So she has some some really really sharp investigative skills. And what I find fascinating is a lot of her personality and characteristics were folded into Felicity Smoke for the TV show Arrow. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So. I know. I I like to do that. Uh, Also, the Hall of Justice was based on the Hall of Justice in Cleveland. There's an actual building in Cleveland that looks like the Hall of Justice. Yeah. Is is it truly based on that? It wasn't just a coincidence? It wasn't just a coincidence. Okay. Okay. So so I found that very fascinating. And so uh, the everybody's having their weekly meeting sort of Batman's playing pool and people are doing different things and you know, Superman's losing to Marvin. Uh, but then there's a, uh, the trouble alert, which this is the first time we ever get to see the trouble alert. Uh, the That's trouble like alert. What? The trouble alert. Trouble alert. Notice it's T R U B L A R E R T. You know, it's not trouble alert. It's trouble alert. As one word. Yeah, I, I did, and I really appreciated it, the way it <laughs> rolled off. And I like that it, Trouble Alert has its own uh, its own logo. It's got like it a does. little lightning bolt. Yes. That's crazy. It's somebody took the time to design that. I, I loved it. Um, so you get the Trouble Alert, um, it, and it says that a train is as losing power on Donner Pass. And you and I talked about this, so bring bring this up, Adam. 
Uh, yeah, Donner Pass. Uh, and the first thing I uh, thought of was uh, Richard Donner, who directed uh, the 1978 uh, Superman movie. Right. Yeah. Uh, since the subtitles that were on DC Universe on the app covered up the uh, trademark, or not the trademark, but the copyright year at the very beginning, I didn't have any idea how old this show was. And, and I was, I guess I could have looked it up on my phone, but I was trying to take notes and pay attention and felt that Googling would have distracted me. So I didn't bother to look and I was like, I'll wait for this recording to ask this question but i just thought that was really neat that there was a donner pass and then somebody named donner would go on to uh, work on the uh, superman movie so now i found this uh, so superman goes to answer the call uh one of the things that was really telling is that as superman is is gonna go um to donner pass which is in like uh the sierra nevada mountains Right. So he's he's flying from I think the Hall of Justice is based in Metropolis. So he's flying to the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, And one of the things I found interesting is Superman takes off immediately to help because he says, I have some experience with trains. Yes. Fascinating because of his whole like uh, more powerful than a locomotive. You know, like that's a that's a really nice way to. give a hat tip to his, his, you know, his very notorious, because at this point Superman has had a TV show, uh, animated serials, animated cartoons on filmation. Um, and, uh, uh, I mean his, and radio shows. So he, Superman has been sort of preeminent in the American pop, pop, pop culture zeitgeist. So I thought that that was really fascinating. Um, and I, I did see um, – what's interesting about the show is that they can't do a lot with, like, hand-to-hand combat. And uh, so a lot more of their missions are uh, investigative-based than, like, punching an enemy out. Um, so I did find there to be at least a, a, a pretty sizable amount of drama when Superman is trying to stop the trains from colliding. Yes, there there seem to be a lot of instances of we must stop some very large vehicle from doing damage. Right. And 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 that I think is is fascinating because um you know you you're dealing with forces that are 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 primordial in nature, you know, the force of nature, the force of gravity, you know, like the force of momentum. So here you know, Superman is is saving this train that is literally careening downhill because it's lost its power uh, and is about to hit another train. I mean, I I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of rescue uh, aspects of rescue fiction in there, and being a rescue worker and a first responder in there that I I found really really fascinating. So Superman is ultimately successful in saving the train. Um, but nobody figures out why the train has lost power, uh, at least none of the super friends. But we, as viewers, see a weird UFO sort of draining power from uh, some sort of power from um, from these trains. But we are left to wonder as we set up what happens next. Um, Want to talk a little bit about the heroes we see next, Adam? Oh, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, isn't the next sequence there's problems with um, an ocean liner so yes. jumps to Aquaman's turn to uh, shine yes. and which made me uh, wonder as I was taking my notes was the inclusion of Aquaman into the Super Friends just for the sole purpose of having water scenarios well Aquaman was incredibly popular in the 1960s so okay. Um, I mean, incredibly popular. He and Superman, it was, before it was the Batman Superman hour, it was the Superman Aquaman hour. So really? Aquaman had his own series of, of, of cartoons that were uh, incredibly popular. Um, and I think that there's an aspect of that um, that they really wanted to bring here. I mean, and also we're, we're talking 1973, so we're already like, in the beginnings of the energy crisis. 
so there was a, a opportunity to deal a lot more with um, things that were preeminent in people's minds, you know, like harvesting hydroelectric power, um, dealing with s- s- hurricanes and storms. I, I think the things like the Poseidon Adventure were prescient in people's minds. So I think that there was a lot of um, opportunity to really explore that. I mean, in the 70s, we, we got a lot more um, aquatic adventures, like things like the TV show Man from Atlantis. So I think that there was a preeminent occupation with things like that and underwater exploration, like with Jacques Cousteau. So I think that um, just like, you know, the 1980s was rife with outer space stuff, you know, yes. and NASA, I, I think water exploration was a big part of ways that we were looking at um, the planet and conservation um, in the 1970s. And I think Aquaman became a, a really natural um, opportunity to, to use that character to explore those sorts of things. Okay. So that, I, I wasn't aware of any of that. And of course, I grew up in the era of... Uh, making me sound like I'm younger than I am or something, but just the joke that, you know, Aquaman, all he does is talk to fish and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I yeah. had no idea that he was that popular, but now that you mentioned uh, he had a cartoon, and I have vague memories of seeing um, VHS cassettes at like, places to rent videos as a kid with Aquaman cartoon. Yeah, so in the those cartoons, uh, it was Aquaman, Aqualad, and Mira. Uh, and then Aquaman had his own Power Records set. So, um, I mean, he was a very preeminent character uh, from the 1960s to the early 1970s. Uh, okay. I think Super Friends sort of diminishes, not this particular era, but as we get more through Super Friends, it then started to become something where it's like, oh, we need Aquaman here because, you know, we we have Aquaman on the team and we need to do something with water. But at least in these early episodes, they really make a lot of use of Aquaman. There, It's not this particular episode, but an episode later on in the season called Dr. Pelagian's War is basically like Aquaman versus like uh, an evil version of Aquaman who's like part Aquaman, part like uh, Captain Nemo from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So they really try to um, bring a lot of weight to Aquaman, at least in these early couple of seasons. Okay. And what's interesting about um, this is not only is Aquaman there, obviously, but before Aquaman shows up to save the ocean liner, you know, what was nice about the Superman scene is that we got to see a vignette of Superman doing his thing. So this is a pilot episode, right? So what they've done with this episode cleverly is pair off heroes so you can see each of their abilities. So yes. we see Superman saving a train. Fantastic. If you're not familiar with Superman, this is this is a great introduction to who he is. Um, then Aquaman, obviously, we get to see him do cool stuff with commanding fish and all that other stuff. But before that, we learn about Wonder Woman and how she's using telepathy to control her invisible jet. Okay. So, so literally, Aquaman is like, I find it fascinating, Wonder Woman, that you can control your invisible plane with telepathy. You know, and, and that All gives right. you a lot of yeah. in, in, insight into Wonder Woman, what she can do. Because that's when they kick out the Wonder Woman and Aquaman run to the invisible jet. And they kick Marvin and Wonder Dog out because they're like, we're ready to go and help. And they're like, no, this is too much of an emergency to do that. Okay. And then we break up the team again after Aquaman saves Queen Victoria to seeing the the detective characters, Batman, Robin, Marvin, Wendy, and Wonder Dog, um, driving on the coast in the Batmobile. Um you know, and having to save construction workers because, you know, the train lost power, the Queen Victoria lost power, now this construction site has lost power. So it yes. seems like it, it's interesting, like I said, how we cluster these characters up to show and spotlight different pieces of their um, different different abilities that they have. 
I was also really impressed with the Batmobile's ability to seat five. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, you figure four and then a dog. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But he's a fairly good-sized dog. Right. <laughs> Isn't he a great day? He looks like a yeah. great day. Well, uh, if they're copying the Scooby-Doo formula, then yes, he is a great day. Yeah. So, um, so through a series of incidents, um, all the superheroes come back together, all the super friends come back together, and they come back to the Hall of Justice, and they find that these incidents where things are losing power ha- has been a preeminent theme. Um, and that there's a hydroelectric plant that is uh, in danger of flooding. So, again, we get the Super Friends sort of in these different rescue scenarios, which I think is, is really fascinating. So we're, we're coupling the characters up together, and again, it, it's these um, watching the heroes perform these first responder-like tasks to, um, to deal with these these big events. So it's, we saw them all operate individually and now stopping this dam from bursting is Batman, Robin, Superman, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, all the, everybody working together. So we've broken them up as a team and now we see how they work together as a unit, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah. That you bring, you bring this up and I did notice that as I was watching it, I was like, this is really cool that they're giving everybody a chance to, get to know these characters individually and then watch them uh, work as a unit since they are a team. Right. Yeah, they are a team. And I, I, I found that very fascinating. So to sort of wrap up the summary from, from what was a very long, I mean, generally super friends episodes are about 22 minutes each, but this first season, they were 42 minutes long. Um, Every episode is. Yeah, each episode is 42 minutes long of this first season. Okay. I That was a question I had in my notes. I was like, why is this so long? Was this something that was spread out over two days? Like they did a part one and a part two? Or was it just this is how it aired? I mean, 42 minutes long is, you know, that's with commercials if if you're not counting the commercials breaks. So uh, just I wonder what the reasoning was behind having an Where hour. Were they, coming from the, they were coming from the Superman Batman hour. Oh, got you, got you. So, okay, so they're they're coming from this thing where they already have an hour of programming, you know, and, and people are really familiar with that. So, um, you know, it, it became this really great opportunity to just put all of these episodes in together and and lump them in. What was um, really fascinating to sort of make this whole episode. Um, this whole episode summary a little bit shorter is that through all these different events, Wendy Harris um, notices that an older gentleman named Sir Cedric Cedric is at each one of these events. And she is able to piece together that this gentleman is at each of these events. And it seems very peculiar after some investigation and using her brain Batman, as Batman said, the most important superpower. Um, they learn that Sir Cedric Cedric is the is at the emergency room central hospital. But if he's at the emergency room central hospital, how can he also be at every one of these events? Why? I I I, I wouldn't have any idea. Well, it's because <laughs> it's because Adam. That the alien we saw at the beginning of the episode, who literally took on his image as a disguise, and he has been using his UFO ship to steal power from all of these all of these places uh, to send it back to his planet, um, because his, the citizens of his planet failed to heed con- the conservationists, and they ran out of power. And Anthro, the alien, the power pirate, came to Earth to steal our power to send it back to his planet. I know, I, I had written down, it's a warning on the dangers of resource depletion by depleting another planet's resources. <laughs> I know, but it was, it was, it was really fascinating, right? Um, it was. And, and the power pirate, he, he's not like a jerk or anything about it. He's just like, I, I was trying to help my people. <laughs> 
Right. And I, when you know, I he, found- he took he, he took Cedric Cedric to the emergency room so right. he could get his leg fixed. So he's not like a bad guy at all. Oh, well, and well, uh, it's fascinating because uh, he's voiced by Ted Knight, Ted Baxter from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. All right. Do you remember watching the Mary Tyler Moore Show? Uh, no, I, I I've never seen an episode. Have of you that. ever seen the TV show Too Close for Comfort? Uh, it has been ages. Well, Ted Knight is the lead cartoonist in Too Close for Comfort. Okay, he does. He wears like a little moose glove. He's a Saturday morning. He does comic strips. Oh God, it's been a really long time. Oh, uh, it's all right. That's fine. He's he's literally the model for um, Ron Burgundy. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So that's why his dog's name is Baxter in Ron Burgundy. Uh, this, these are so many Easter eggs and asides. The reason Ron Burgundy's okay. dog is named okay. Baxter is because he's named after Ted Baxter, who was played okay. by Ted Knight from Mary Tyler Moore. Should, should I bark twice if I'm in Milwaukee? Yes. Yeah, yes. Should, yes. Next time you go to Milwaukee, you should visit the <laughs> Mary Tyler Moore station. So, okay. um, so in in summary, that is what we've seen from the first episode of Superman. That we've talked about the characters, and we've talked about the the basic summary with some asides. What did you think of this episode, Adam? Okay, before I do that, I have an, another question to ask, and I'm and these are my notes. So the the uh, big solution to solving Anthro's power is that Superman's going to go to his planet. And he's going to turn their moon into a big mirror to reflect solar energy to the planet. And, Correct. And my question is, why hasn't Superman done this for Earth? Well, is hey. he in big oil's pocket? What? <laughs> is, is Superman is he- in big oil's pocket? <laughs> I think that uh, the difference is is that um, it's a, a dire scenario. So okay. if he were to do that, I mean, I think that Superman should probably do a little bit of research first. But if he were to do that here, um, you know, I think you'd need to accommodate for, like, what our heating and cooling cycles are. Because if our Earth got any hotter, uh, we would all die. That's true. Because of global climate change, right? We're already yes. experiencing um, global warming. So if, if Superman were to turn our moon into a giant mirror, our polar ice caps would melt and we would all be drowning. Okay. And then we would need the help of Aquaman. But will he save us? I don't know. Because you made fun of him on the podcast, Adam. I did. <laughs> that's that's the repercussions. That's that's what happens when you make fun of Aquaman. Yeah, now he's a jerk. <laughs> uh, to answer your question, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna set aside like my I, I'm being a little silly because I'm a 43 year old man watching this cartoon aimed at children. Uh, that is literally, I mean, the show is literally 46 years 46 old. Years old. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed it for the most part. You know, it, it's a lot of fun to see the characters interact. Uh, it was very, it was a very comfortable feeling watching this show. Uh, I recognize, you know, like a lot of the background music from, as you like Scooby-Doo or the Jetsons or even, you know, sound effects from this show, you know, still hearing them up into cartoons from the 80s, like G.I. Joe or Transformers. So there were a lot of, like, uh, audio cues that were very comforting because there was like, I remember hearing these sounds when I was a kid and, and enjoying cartoons. Uh, you know, Super Friends, uh, Justice League, was it all? Did it ever changed being called justice league or was it always just no like, it was always the super friends like challenge and then the it was and, then it was the challenge of the super friends sometimes within the episodes of the super friends they would call it the justice league like so okay. if you watch the super friends the introduction is like 
the Justice League of America versus the Legion of Doom. This is Challenge of the Super Friends. Yes, um, yes. So sometimes interchangeably, they'll be called the Justice League. And then the last two seasons, they were called like the Super Powers Team to sort okay. of keep it more in line with um, to keep it more in line with the Super Powers action figures. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, this it's not something I remember a lot from my youth, uh, especially the stuff with Marvin and Wendy. Like every once in a while, one of those episodes would creep in. You know, I much more remember when the team was bigger and, and you had like, uh, was it, um, who is the samurai dude? And, and samurai. His name is Samurai. Samurai. And is there, was there a guy who was kind of like a genie? Uh, uh, so there was, there was nobody who was, there was a bad guy that they fought that was like a genie. Okay. Fought, so it was, Samurai, Apache Chief, Black Vulcan, El Dorado, okay, Adam, Hawkman, Hawkwoman, Green Lantern, Flash, um, Rima, the Jungle Girl. Um, so there was a lot of diversity in terms of some of the characters we saw over the course. The Cyborg and Firestorm, obviously. Okay. Yeah, th- okay. Th- this is probably where I started becoming a little bit more familiar with the DC characters, but I think this one was, this show was on during the weekdays where I lived. So catching it was just very, just kind of hit and miss depending on, Oh, it's summer and I'm not in school and I just happen to be home. You know, I don't remember it being on like Saturday morning or Sunday morning where the bulk of my cartoon watching was done. So I don't, remember a lot of the specifics of super friends from my childhood you know i remember the music as soon as the music hit i was like oh yeah i know this right but you know like specific stories and and, and things like that i i don't recall but it it was cool to it was cool to see and I can only imagine, like, being a kid in 1973 who is really into comics in 1973, how awesome this would have been to have this on TV. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was very interesting. The, I love Super Friends as a whole as a great gateway into um, what I loved about comics. I mean, like, what I love about DC mostly comes from the Super Friends. Uh so I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert, but I'm super nerdy about these episodes. Um, one of the things I like, despite it's sort of its cheesiness, one of the things I, um, you know, with the inclusion of like Wendy, Marvin and Wonder Dog, in particular Marvin and Wonder Dog, uh, one of the challenges with um, that goofiness aside, that sort of like need to make it more like Scooby-Doo aside, I understand sort of the desire to do that. Um, because you're you're taking something that's familiar, Scooby Doo, and you're putting it into, and something that works from the Batman Superman cameos that they did. Um, you're trying to take something that works and introduce new viewers to something totally unique and different. You know, um, Batman and Robin had some familiarity to people because of the Batman TV show from 1966, um, but you know, like really looking at opportunities to, to grow the audience with the super friends, I thought was great. Putting all the characters together, I thought was fantastic from a narrative standpoint. I think that this story holds together really well. Um, you're, you're, this is a pilot episode and you're, you're really trying to do interesting things to highlight each characters, highlight them as a team and come together, uh, with a sort of a nonviolent solution. You know what I mean? So ultimately, um, I I think it works. Could it be more exciting? Um, sure, but we're judging a 1973 show against a 2019 standards. So I, I think that by and large, I, I'm really happy with with how it works together. Yeah, I I, I can't complain about it. I, I like you said this this thing's almost 50 years old. Right. And, and and there are just 
different uh, different standards and practice on the television back then. And I, as you said, there wasn't any violence in this whatsoever. You know, right. Nobody threw a punch at anybody else. It was all you know, problem solving. We have a problem. Here's the solution. Here's how we'll stop the train. Here's how we'll save the ship. Here's how we'll save the construction workers. Here's how we'll stop the dam from flooding the valley below. You know, it was all here. We are. We have a problem. Let's solve it. And uh, it it was fun to see how they were able to achieve all the uh, solutions to all these problems and, and they I, I, did hold up i it, it was you know, 43 minutes long but it it flowed pretty well I and mean, there's a little bit maybe in the middle that dragged when it was more focused on marvin and wendy and wonder dog and i was just like oh my god how much longer do we have to be with these i want more super friends this is why i'm right. tuning in not for the scooby gang light but uh but o- overall you know it it was enjoyable uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that ultimately, um, Wendy in particular makes for a really good POV character. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like whether or not the, the viewers can see themselves in Wendy because nobody else has, everybody else has powers, you know? But Wendy is like this, she's almost like Nancy Drew, which was a really preeminent archetype at the time. You know, she's she's an investigator. And I, I really admire that aspect of her, um, and I like that those elements of her are sort of seen in other forms, because Wendy and Marvin appear in Young Justice. Um, like I said, there's aspects of the Young Justice cartoon. There's aspects of Wendy that appear in Felicity Smoke for the Arrowverse. Um, Wendy and Marvin both appeared in Teen Titans, and later Wendy appeared in Batgirl, so I do love that those elements have been brought forth in her character. Okay. So she has made other appearances. Then. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, if you know or what you think, do, do you think that uh, as the Super Friends show ran and people became more familiar with the concept, that's why eventually like Marvin and Wendy and Wonder Dog were phased out of the show that they didn't need that like Scooby Doo aspect to bring viewers in because the show was popular enough that they they didn't need that bit on it well so Wendy and Marvin only lasted a season and then we ended up getting Zan and Jaina and Galik and I think that they replace these characters who don't have powers with super powered teens. Um, and to, to varying degrees, I prefer Wendy and Jaina over Zan and Marvin, the brothers, okay. the, the male characters of those duos are always super unlikable. I wonder why that is. I, I don't know, but they're just, um, but Zan and Jaina were based on Donnie Marie Osmond and their names oh, are we're... taken from, Tarzan. So it's Zan and Jaina. So it's like Tarzan and Jane. So oh. their so their names have like this very pulpy feel. Um, right. So and they're interesting. I I do like I do like the Wonder Twins, but they're often again used for comic relief. Um, but I I like Jaina. I think she's great. I like Wendy. I think she's great. I think. When the show, so the second season of the show, um, you know, what was interesting, um, and then we got into the third season with like the challenge of the super friends, you know what I mean? And that became, we didn't get Wendy or Marvin or Zan or Jaina, uh, and the show became much darker. Um, so I think that familiar, the concept was interesting. The, the super friends constantly tried to evolve and change itself. Uh, every season, which I really appreciated. I think that, um, I mean, a lot of people love the challenge of the Super Friends seasons, and I, I don't think they're wrong. The Legion of Doom episodes are fantastic. My favorite season of the Super Friends is something called The World's Greatest Super Friends. There are only like eight episodes that season, but they're all based on, rather than fighting super villains. Or even dealing with like conservation issues like this the nineteen the first season. 
Um, they're all deal with like fairy tales and myths. So it's okay. like there's there's like knights of the uh, there's like knights of the round table, one thousand one Arabian Nights. Uh, there is a twenty thousand leagues under the sea version. Super Friends battling Frankenstein. Super Friends and the Wizard of Oz. So there's a lot of different um, elements that they all tie together to tell a a really interesting season. And the opening for that season is crazy. It's got killer robots and giant spiders and monsters coming out of lava and Baphomet looking demonic Cthulhu things. Uh, that is my favorite season of the Super Friends. And, you know, it continued. The show continued. Eventually, we got a season with Firestorm. And then later in the last season, a season with Cyborg that was going to be a pilot for the new Teen Titans cartoon, which we never got. Okay. Yeah, I jumped on Wikipedia here because I like something you said about, oh, it turned into like the superpowers show. And I was like, well, superpowers was mid 80s and this thing started in 73. How long did this thing run? And then I'm looking yeah. oh, it, uh, you know, there it ran on and off for 12 years. I mean, not consistently, but it's uh it definitely did, and I think that's where I'm now coming into where, oh, I don't know some of the older episodes because the stuff I'm seeing was the stuff that was running in the 80s. Right. From when I was a kid. Okay. No, this has been great because I'm learning a whole bunch of stuff I did not know. And you have access to the DC Universe app, so you can watch them all now that this episode is over. I do. If, if, if I can rest control the television away from three children who love YouTube. Yeah, there you go. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining um, Adam and I on this special Super Sons for the Love of Comics uh, crossover Crisis on Infinite podcasts event. I am uh, your co-host, David Gallagher. Um, and you, uh, and yeah, I'm your co-host David Gallagher. And who are you? Uh, I'm your other co-host, Adam Vermillion. Where can people find us, Adam? They can find us at, uh, for the love of comics on the fancy pants gangsters podcast network. We are on Twitter at four L C, uh, or maybe no four L comics. Uh, and then over on uh, Facebook, uh, you can search for the love of comics and we'll pop up there and uh, you can find our show on uh, iTunes and also episodes are available to stream or download at fancy pants, gangsters.com. And uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. And we hope to see you on our podcasts soon. Yeah, drop by, uh, stop on by and drop us a line. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to, um, oh, where am I going to go? Okay. Thanks to Dan and Jake for asking us to uh, uh, guest co-host and for the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. <laughs>